service of it. Secure sockets layer. Yes. All right. So uh, again, my name is Arun. So today we'll be talking about how SSL secures um, network communication. So the agenda is kind of simple. Um, the what and why. We look at a little bit about cryptography. Uh, we look at TLS SSL in action in theory and in Wireshark. And finally, I'll give an example of asymmetric crypt cryptography. So SSL stands for Secure Sockets Layer. There is a newer version of that called Transport Layer Security. Most browsers are getting upgraded. Uh, in fact, they are already there. Most of the um, common browsers are upgraded to um, TLS. Right. So there are two steps. So what SSL does is it provides privacy over um, a network communication. There are two steps involved. One is authentication. The other is encryption. We just look at what it is uh, in the next slide. But and and it's the the benefit of using SSL is that um, attacks like eavesdropping, man in the middle, message tampering, and forgery are avoided. The first two is what I can I can talk a little bit about. The last two are related to hashing algorithms, which which I will not be covering. Um, so when you want to talk to someone, you have to basically say, I want to ensure that you are the person I'm talking to, right? That's why people ask us, do you have a photo ID, right? The image matches with your face and the name matches with what you're saying, right? So that is authentication process. So how do you do that on a, on a network call, right? That has to be done because my client only knows an IP, but how, do, how is it sure that that IP belongs to say Dell.com if I'm buying on Dell.com? Right. So first, an authentication process has to happen. Right? That IP is the only IP that uh, that IP belongs to Dell.com and no one else. Right. That process has to happen. Right. So that is the first step of an SSL communication. The next step is the encryption of it. As in, your request object is encrypted, sent to the server. Server decrypts it, sends the response in a in an encrypted format, sends it to us. So. Those, that is the two-step process that's happening. Right? Eavesdropping is basically when two entities are communicating, a third person is actually listening. So, uh, yeah, it's after Dell.com. Right. We are using multiple default So, their default IP address is a different. So, how it's mapping to the... You, you have... We, we'll look at that one. Okay. We'll, I'll actually walk through the thing. Right. Um, so eavesdropping is basically how uh, I mean someone trying to listen in to your communication, right? So that's a bad thing because then they know what your credentials are and all those things, right? That is one type of eavesdropping. Phishing is one type of it. Um, man in the middle attack is basically you are trying to communicate to Dell.com, but there is someone else who has actually broken that communication line, and instead of actually sending your request to Dell.com, you are sending it through this person. So this middle, the man in the middle, knows your details now, right? So that those are the two things that are the biggest um, benefits of going through SSL. Okay, any questions so far? No. Um, before going into the actual step of um, because before stepping into SSL, uh, understanding asymmetric and symmetric cryptography is, is critical. Right. So symmetric cryptography is where you have one key that is used to encrypt and decrypt. Hence symmetric, the same key can be used to encrypt and decrypt a message. Right. So uh, somehow let's assume that the client and the server have communicated this key. And then what the client does is it uses that key, encrypts using that key, sends it to the server. Server uses the same key to decrypt that message, and and vice versa. The flow happens the same way from the other side. Right? The benefits of this is that symmetric cryptographies are simple and less computationally taxing, so it's actually faster, right? For especially for network usage. The downside is that how do you actually ensure that the key is sent to the server and no one else knows about it, right? So the key exchange part is the weakest link in a in a symmetric cryptography, right? In a symmetric algorithm. Okay. So coming to asymmetric cryptography, this is where you have two separate keys. One is called as a public key, the green one, and the other is called as a private key, the red one, right? 
So the, the public key is used only to encrypt and the private key is used only to decrypt. There is no way you can decrypt using the public key. There is no way you can encrypt using the using the private key, right? So the opposite is not possible, hence asymmetric. So it's kind of a one way algorithm. You just encrypt it, send it to the server, server decrypts it. That's it, right? So so the, the typical communication that happens is client says, hey, you know what? I'd like to communicate with you. And the server says, use my public key, right? It gives the public key to everyone. So that public key, using that public key, your client encrypts, sends it to the server, server decrypts using its private key. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's a one-way communication. Mm -hmm. Now the benefit of this is you see that there is no key exchange step required here. Mm -hmm. The public key is sent to anyone and everyone who asks for it. Mm -hmm. And then the private key is maintained by the server. But the downside is, now what happens if the server has to communicate to the client? The client has to have its own public key and private key, right? So each client will have to maintain their own public and private keys, right? And these private and public keys is what you get when you buy an SSL certificate. So it's an expensive deal there. So even before I talk to Dell, if Dell says you have to go buy your own public and private keys, you have to buy your own SSL certificate, there's a good chance I will not do online business, right? The other thing is this. Now, the the I told you that the encryption and decryption process is just taxing in symmetric algorithm, right? That's because the key length is 128 bits, which means that your key size, key value is anywhere between zero to, if it's a 128 bit encryption, your key size is anywhere between zero and two to the power 128, right? That's a huge number, but it's anywhere between that number, right? Those two, those, that is the range. But for asymmetric cryptography, you're talking like two to the power 2048. It's an extremely large number. That's why it takes more, it's computationally ta taxing. Not everyone has a high-end machine, so your client will take a long time to process that, send it to the server, decrypt it, all of those things. So you'll start seeing latency issues, right? Now, just to give an idea of what two to the power 2048 is, uh, I was reading this online somewhere, and it said that if, if you run a for loop from zero to two to the power 2048, and if the growth of computer remains the same, right, whatever it's now, it'll take about 100 years for that processing to complete, right? It's a very long time. So that is the that is the benefit of going with asymmetric, but it has its own, um, it, it's a, it has its own baggage, mm -hmm. right? The understanding of these two algorithms was, was is essential for us to proceed. So you guys have any questions on, on these two algorithms? So, uh, what was the announcement they have in the TLS? You're saying people are they Move, browser right. right. So there are so there is an organization called IETF, Internet Engineering Task Force. They are the ones who are who are talking about these these protocols. They are the one who set up these protocols, right? There are um, so for example, 2014, oh, sorry, 2014, Jan 1 is when a mandate was sent that every SSL should be 2048 bits at least, right? So TLS probably handles it. I don't know the minute details between the two, but TLS probably handles it, SSL does not. That's kind of what I'm, what I'm getting to. Those are minor details for the most part, both are same, right? And it doesn't mean that if your browser is using SSL, it's outdated and it's insecure or whatever, it is still secure, but TLS 1.2 is where every browser is moving and most browsers actually have moved. Okay. So there are very minor minor details um, for, for the sake of this session. It didn't make sense for me to go into that. Okay. Right. Any any other questions? No. So uh, what, what uh, um, SSL does, it uses both asymmetric and symmetric cryptographies to secure our communication. Right. So I said it's a two step process, right? One is authentication, one is encryption, right? So the authentication part of it, this is where the key is exchanged, right? That authentication part is done using a symmetric algorithm, right? Your, en your encryption where your request and response objects are sent and received, that is done using symmetric cryptography. We'll just go into the details of that in just a few. Before, so when you when you have your session and you're looking at Dev Tools and Fiddler, you're seeing your HTTP calls, right? Now for HTTPS, 
even before your get or whatever request is sent to the server there is a handshake process that is the that is the you know, ssl or tls handshake process what happens is your browser first sends a client hello message to the server with a list of supported ciphers now what a cipher is is it is a string with a bunch of code words right so you are seeing a, a couple of ciphers there right so you have that and then that is a second keyword and that is a third keyword right so the first one is the key exchange that is the asymmetric algorithm so diffie hellman is the key exchange algorithm rsa with aes is the encryption algorithm and sha is the hashing algorithm right so this is basically a cipher from a client server's perspective and client basically says i'm going to send you a list of the ciphers that i support right and that the the ciphers are sent to the server in the client hello uh, message now as, as i told client the key exchange determines the server's authentication the encryption algorithm is used to encrypt and decrypt the messages the actual bulk of the message right now with this the server responds with a server hello message these client hello and server hello messages are not just fancy names they are what the protocol mandates that the client is expecting a server hello message right the message should be of type server hello that's 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 the reason why those names are there and then the server says let's use um, one particular thing as the cipher for this session right so the session so your cipher decided by the server your client just gives it a bunch of ciphers and the server decides what cipher we are going to use we we'll just look at a couple of examples here so here's a site uh, housemyssl.com it's actually housemyssl.client.com because it's it's verifying your client right um, and it says here you we are actually talking about tls here not ssl because your browser is up to date and all of those things and it has a bunch of checkpoints right all of them come up good and then these are the ciphers that were sent by my browser firefox to house my ssl how's my to how's my ssl server right so just to read this is elliptic curve diffie hellman algorithm this is the asymmetric algorithm with which key is exchanged right and then the aes is the encryption algorithm right this is with this is where your message gets encrypted and sent to the server and server um, decrypts using the asymmetric algorithm and sha256 is your hashing algorithm right so that is how you read these ciphers right um, another example here Uh, these are again the ciphers. There's a little bit more detail here as to if you want to read up them, um, what is elliptic curve, Diffie-Hellman algorithm, all those things. And then it it gives a little more information. This was the user agent. It's using TLS 1.2, and this this connection uses TLS 1.2 with that cipher, right? So this is what the cipher said. This is what the server said we will use, which happens to be the second one in the list here. Okay. so this is the response from the server so for now nothing has happened exchange except how do we actually communicate is what has happened so far okay as soon as the cipher is decided the server sends its certificate to the client right now once the client receives the certificate it ensures that the that the certificate is valid for the date time that it is talking to the server right on the current date is the server is the certificate valid right and then it also verifies what is called as the common name and subject alternate name Now imagine if your dns server is hacked by someone and they put an entry in there that says when someone says dell.com go to this separate location not the actual dell.com but go to this separate location right mm-hmm. your hacker might even have a certificate which is valid for the date time right but there is no way he will have the common name which is your domain name dell.com there is no way he'll get a second certificate for the same domain because domain is unique there is only one domain and there is only one ip associated with that domain and this comes to you answering your is, question is, is it a domain what i meant is so, it is a domain name right? yes that so Not when IP. you say dell.com when you think dell.com from outside you get one ip no matter where you ping from right you get one ip so that domain name is associated with that dns entry and that is what you get an an uh, certificate from right it's not associated with the ip it's still associated with the domain name the dell.com right so your common name someone ping okay so 
your common name we will see this in in uh, wireshark your common name is say dell.com and then your subject alternate names are a list of names right so www.dell.com is another alternate uh, dell.com.co dell.co.in is another alternate so any of these matches the server the client says okay the certificate is valid for that that so that domain right so your common name and subject alternate name prevents dns poisoning this whole thing was called as dns poisoning right someone poisons your dns you are actually sending it to some other place not the actual domain right and the third thing that the client does is it verifies that the uh, certificate is issued by a trusted certificate authority mm -hmm. certificates are issued by companies called as certificate authorities right now some random guy can issue a certificate right so that is not it's not that easy but they can still hack into those things so that's why your client says i'm going to see who issued that certificate for you how's my ssl.com i'm going to see who issued that certificate for you and then it goes to the root of it and then what a trusted certificate authority means is that every computer has a list of trusted authorities already mentioned in it right when you install your operating system all of these come come to you right your client your browser looks at this list and says oh you know what centrum ca is a trusted authority likewise uh, digicert is also this, these are root certificates right this is also a, a trusted certificate authority you have geotrust global ca you have godaddy here you have verisign right all of these are already are already listed in your machine right so if the root doesn't match then the pro, then the browser says then your client says okay i'm, I'm this is not this is not clear water so it is murky water so i don't want to be so that's when you get those warnings or you know the certificate is not valid you should not be there all those things right so once all of these three steps are verified your server is actually authenticated right there is no other ip domain that can have the certificate right so your server is authenticated at this point okay as soon as your server is authenticated what the client does is the, the session key creation part starts this is where the session key is exchanged with that server right so client generates a random number right now you have the encryption the key exchange algorithm right in the previous one the server selected a cipher right so tiffy hellman becomes your key exchange algorithm right so what what the client does next is he takes that random number it reads a public key from the certificate this is a public key for the asymmetric algorithm it encrypts it with the method that, that the your cipher mentioned the first first code word of your cipher that is the method so browser knows how to encrypt using diffie hellman right so the, one of the reasons why you want to upgrade your browsers to the latest versions is this probably they have added more and more encryption algorithms right so Correct. One is the first thing value current day comes to the situation. So, I'm I'm making an HTTP call at 12:26 p.m. right on this particular date. Is that certificate valid for that date? That date range? Okay. That is what that means. Okay. So that is client based. That client based because the server sends a certificate and the so certificate the has a expiry expiry date. It says from to those dates are there so client just make ensure that the current date lies between those those two ranges you you can see like lot of internal applications you see certificate expired right? yes so that is basically what it is okay so now with with the key exchange algorithm and the public key the random number is encrypted and sent to the server right no one else can know this because the keys are huge really huge decrypting them takes a long time provided someone hacks into the private key which no one else knows right so that's that's how this the the key is sent safely to the server server decrypts this and this key becomes the session key the asp session key that we have right so now that step is over your client and the browser say hey you know what the handshake message is over at this point they both exchange messages there are protocol messages that they exchange and then the client says okay uh, i am going to encrypt using the encryption algorithm and the key the session key that we discussed that we exchange and then sends the request the encrypted request to the server the server decrypts it using the same key so this is the um, 
symmetric algorithm in place right now right so the bulk of it your request and response are uh, encrypted and decrypted using the symmetric algorithm that's what i talked about here and the server sends only valid uh, certificate which has uh, which is not external yes right? yes so that's why you have to have the latest and the greatest certificate on installed on your certificate on your server okay i'm just thinking about time zone how it works if a client is in japan and the server is in us the time zone is at 24 hours right so in that case how it works so it is it is the onus of the server to make sure that you don't go that last few hours kind of a range right okay. it, is, it is the maximum is 24 hours so they ensure that the certificate they put in is is valid for at least is it before it expires right a couple of days yeah that's the governance process okay so i've covered a lot of these things in this slide any questions on this one we will look at why shark and actually step through this whole process but any anything any questions you have here cool so so while shark um, is a protocol analyzer tool your your dev tools your yeah <laughs> yes it was supposed to um so your dev tools your fiddler are used to track only http https calls wireshark um looks into any protocol that is used to communicate uh, over the network right so here is a trace i have from uh, quite some time ago uh, let me just okay so uh, i i actually did it from home so little bit of resizing here so what i did was i started up i uh, started wireshark i went to uh, i don't know which browser i was using i opened up a browser and i said how's my ssl how's my ssl and then i did control enter right so when i did that the first thing my my uh, this is me 1.3 this is my machine and this is my modem right so my machine basically asked my modem hey what do i do when someone says dab 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 how's my ssl.com right what do i do there and then your my modem says hey you know what when you get an ssl call when you when you get a when you get a dns call like that with that query right what you do is you actually start talking to that address so that is the ip address and this is what we get for dell.com as well so it's one ip right so 141 is the server now right so all requests are sent to 141 and all responses are sent to 1.3 as soon as it gets to know the ip your client makes a call again http get call remember i did a control enter so it the the shortcut filled in all the http www and the dot com for me right so a http call was made and then the server responded 141 responded saying i have moved permanently and my address now is https right so it sends back saying now you have to switch to https the moment your client gets to know that it, it has to start talking on the https protocol the handshake process begins so this is where your client hello message gets sent first right so that, that was the first step in the handshake it will send to the same ip right it will it will always send to the same ip now right so you are you are looking at this it's 1.3 to 141 okay so and then these are the ciphers i was talking about right these are the bunch of ciphers that my browser sent to the server right and then server responds with the server hello message and then it says let's use that as the selected cipher so here it says let's use elliptic curve diffie hellman algorithm for the key exchange part of it let's use rsa with aes as the encryption algorithm and let's use sha as the hashing algorithm that's what it's saying right so remember elliptic curve diffie hellman diffie hellman algorithm right now as soon as the server sends a server hello message the server again sends its certificates right so you're seeing that there are two certificates here the first one let's verify that the certificate is valid for my time right so it is 2013 december 31st it is not before and not after the end of this year so the certificate is still valid this call was made some time back ago but the certificate is still valid it will be valid till the end of this year right so the first check is is a pass and then the next one is you are seeing here something called as a common name right so this common name is how's my ssl.com this is the common name for that domain right so that is also verified because that is the call i made from my browser 
And then uh, let's look at the subject alternate names. Right. So these are the subject alternate names. They are passed as an extension. So these are the alternate names. So www.housemysssl.com, housemytls.com is also part of this one. www.housemytls.com and just the housemyssl.com. So all of these are alternate names. All of these are approved. All of these are approved to use that same certificate. That's basically what all of this means, right? So it's not necessary that. For each domain, you have to use it. You as the site owner can say, I have these alternates for my site and for all of them, I want one certificate, right? So this, pro this. Oh, one question sure. is, so, uh, is the certificate download every, uh, every time uh, we. For a session, for a session, if your, if your browser has not cached that certificate, it has to be downloaded. Okay. For every so all of this is per session, right? So your 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 for, session. For example, Google. I am using one session. Then I right. go to the browser and open a Google again. Right. So it will download the certificate again, or it will use. So the, actually, the the step we will see that here there are multiple calls that are happening. So mm -hmm. your client hello will be sent multiple times to the server, mm -hmm. right? The protocol just ignores it. Right? Okay. So if the browser already has a certificate, mm -hmm. if it's already cached in, in the browser's memory, it probably will not request for it because it takes okay. time for yeah, all of those things, right? the bandwidth and all of those things. For this non-browser things, or which browser it takes, like a web client So there is, there is, I think, um, it will use yeah, a default uh, user agent. There probably is a default user agent. So web client, will, we can actually, we can look at a web client call and see how um, what user agent will come by. So web client, you are saying like Windows Phone? No, your, when you I make a web client. the default browser, right? Use, I think uh, IE, like, IE is Yeah, a, so IE is, IE is Windows what Windows normally whatever is the default. I don't know what it is. Yeah, so Windows is always IE. Even for web API. <laughs> but your web API is... When it makes an HTTPS call, yes, it's, it's using a the default browser. Yes, it's a domain. Web API, you are accessing yeah. from domain, right? No, so, I, have, I have Windows application called Web API. Okay. It has a browser, a default browser. You can call Web API. Yes. 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 So uh, there, uh, this thing because handshake will be different there. So how it we are going the same, to? right? I don't think why. So as per you. Browser sends these information. Your client, your client mm. has all of that information. Yeah. So if you are doing a web API call, and I'm, I'm, I agree with Sanjeev, it will use the default browser's uh, settings, we have whatever. We, we have to validate. I think we are doing a cross-domain thing. So cross-domain thing should be enabled on the server for your application. Correct. Then only you can yes, yes, yeah. only then. then but even then, and the these things, is not on these the things whatever handshake uh, Arun is talking about, mm -hmm. we have to define it in our application. Because oh, we are not application, yes. we are not some kind of a browser. We have some kind of a window application and which I, we have to should, define. It should things. be a part of your uh, your uh, authentication framework. Yeah. Right? Your framework. We can just do an API call. We should do that. I think it's more of a like, like a framework like OpenID or OpenAuth, right? If you begin with your Windows form, it can do that one. Right? You don't have to write a specific code in your application. Okay. So now, now coming to the root of it, let's look at the issuer. Um, who issued the certificate? The certificate was issued by Global Trust SSL CAG2. And then what the client does is it looks at the root, the certificate, the issuer of that one to check the root. And it says the issuer of that one was Global Trust, GeoTrust Global CA. And we see that Global GeoTrust Global CA is part of the trusted root. So this, all of these three steps authenticates the server. Okay. Now, as soon as that is done, uh, there is an optional step here. This now your your key exchange process begins. But before that, for Diffie Hellman algorithm, there is an extra step where the server has to send some extra parameters for the client to be to encrypt using Diffie Hellman. So that is an optional step here. Right. So as soon as that is done. Your server says, you know what, I'm done with all of the message, all of the information that I need to send to the client, right? That is the server, hello, hello, done message. Again, all of these are protocol based. Each, each of those text actually means something, right? Then the client sends its uh, message, 
the client sends the session key. This is encrypted using Diffie-Hellman Diffie -Hellman algorithm, and uh, it has used the it has generated a random number. Right? It has generated a random number, encrypted it, and this is what is being sent to the server. Server uses the private key for this Diffie-Hellman algorithm. It uses the private key and then decrypts to get to know what the session key is. But this is just the sending part of it. And this message says, for this session, let's use the session key. And client says, I'm done with the handshake message messaging, right? My handshake is done here. Server says, agreed, we have a new session key. I will accept this. I will honor this session key for this session. And it says, my handshake is done here. Right. So this is the complete handshake for SSL. Right. Now, now is the time when your browser actually makes a request to the client, the sending the request object. But interestingly, you don't see any HTTP or HTTPS calls here. Right. There are no HTTP HTTPS calls here. That is because the message itself is being sent as application data on the TLS protocol, the record layer. Right. So that's what you're seeing here, the TLS record layer. So that is the encrypted yeah. message that is being sent. This is where your credit cards, your username, passwords are being sent. Right. And then what the server does is it takes. So you're seeing the request here. The request length is 560 and then the server 141 to 1 1.3. That is the server's response. Right? So your browser again decrypts this using the session key, symmetric algorithm, decrypts this and renders the HTML on the page. Right? Now there are a few more steps that are happening here. So your HTML that came back had a reference for code.jquery.com. So there is a jQuery library there. The same process begins again. So uh, um, DNS lookup begins and then there is a client hello for 2.30. Um, then there is a server hello somewhere here. For 2.30, there are server hello, there are certificates, right? The same process begins for each domain that is being sent and... Okay, so suppose in our HTTP URL, I'm using HTTP version of our jQuery library, what I'm referencing that one. What yes, I so this is where you'll get mixed content issues. So it will not be uh, encrypted, right? That's that won't, that won't, that will not be encrypted because it's HTTP. Your browser is smart enough to say, okay, this, there is mixed messaging that is here. You are on HTTPS and HTTP, and that is why you get those messages. Those warning signs that you get, that is what you get. Okay, so if I just scroll down a little more, there is one more here for Google Analytics. Right? There is one more for Google Analytics, and the same process begins, right? So from 1.3 to 33, there is a client hello, so the same process begins. Right. So for every domain, okay. it, it has to verify, it has to authenticate, and then it has to encrypt. Right. So that process, whatever we discussed for Osma SSL, that has to happen for every domain that is there. Yeah. So this. Latency would be done, right? Yes. For a request, all this will make the latency. Every. Um, so the latency that, that HTTP users are concerned about is just the application data. Right, sending and the receiving of the actual request. Yes, you see, now, if you remove WhatsApp, right, if you go to HTML, mm -hmm. I can see the latency. How much right, right. So this latency. That is only for data. that application data call. That is all this. What are the other? Right. Everything so works. everything. See, because it the entire latency is how much time it took to render the page. Yeah, right? I agree with that one. From first one to the last byte. Okay. I was just thinking like some yeah. issues come like latency, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for this one, that's what it's. So that's what for SSL you have that additional overhead of timing, right? All of these authentication steps have to happen before the page gets rendered. That is that is why you cannot use um, you cannot use uh, the asymmetric algorithm to send and receive message every time. Right? It will be really huge. That's what I mean. So one question. Uh, sure. So. Uh, Suppose for jQuery, I'm going to their jQuery Google, mm -hmm. Google CDN and getting it. So it's an extra step because they have their own certificate to encrypt yes. and decrypt. Yes. So what is the benefit of storing there? We can store in our one right? Exactly, exactly. So that if we had stored it in our pay on our on our servers, that call wouldn't have happened. Then why they are saying we have to use CDNs? So CDNs, the benefit is the actual. Um, the request, if your if your browser already has an HTTPS cache, that step will be ignored. 
The yes, the DP, yes. The, the call will not happen. The call will not happen because they don't check in the cash. Yes, it will check in the cash. If it's there, so all of these processes begins only if the client has to make an HTTPS call. Right? Mm -hmm. If it so doesn't, so it works with geolocation, location, right? Geo location takes. Yeah. So what he's saying is, so it's cache, right? So the call will never happen. Yeah, but what you're doing, if you put in your Google, your uh, your yes, application. application. Yeah. Now we have a server in Austin, for example. Yes. Every time, every time it has to go to Austin. If it has some server in Singapore, mm -hmm. it will it take from Singapore. It will take from the closest so location. All the hops can be solved by. Oh, that is different thing. What I'm asking is different. CDN, one of the uses. Six, use, I'm not about CDN. I'm talking about why we are using different URLs, right? So, so Google has CDN, right? So, resolving means you have to do a call, and then call means you have to do, get a certificate and downloading. So, what he is saying is caching is there, right? First, it's check a cache. So if CDN already cached, that means it will not do anything. It will not take that extra call. Resolving CDN to a Geolocation is a separate thing, right? It's more fun. Now, e is more of a spirey, I think. Old. How, yes. how old is your. Normally, e tag is used by a browser to refresh the content, whether the content is cached or not. Is it old content or server is, ref... server is a new one? So, now the interesting thing is this if I get a hold of the private key for any of these domains, mm -hmm. I can put it in, in Wireshark. And Wireshark will actually decrypt and give me plain text messages of all of these. Right? So Wireshark has that ability. You can actually put the pri private key in here, and then it will decrypt all of these messages for me and just show it to me in plain text. So then, man, the middle attack can attack this one. But how will I get a private key for for how's my SSL or any other domain? That is the question, right? No, here you're getting private key, right? Uh, no, no, no. If I get the private key. Oh, then yeah, that's the, that is scary. Probably. I asked. I they declined. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so any questions on the on the flow of this one? Okay, now I, as the last step, I just want to show an example of using um, asymmetric algorithm to encrypt and decrypt messages, right? So that is the expression. So that is the, so this is the base of Diffie-Hellman algorithm. Okay. So that expression. I think it's called as Fermat's little theorem or something like that, right? There is there's a bigger theorem out of that one. But that expression, m to the power e uh, modulus n, um, I'm using the same expression on the encrypting side and on the decrypting side, right? So column f and column k are using the same expression but different values. So modulus, as you guys know, is uh, it gives you the the reminder of a of a division. Right. Modulus is also modulus mathematics is also called as clock mathematics. So imagine a clock and uh, there are 12 equal divisions. You have a string of length 17. You start rolling the, the rolling your string over the clock and you'll come back to 12 and there is still some some thread left. Right. So when you continue, you'll end at five because so that is what modulus is. It gives you the reminder. Right. So that's why 17 mod 12 is five. Right. You, you just imagine a clock and start rolling over. Right. So that is modulus. And then uh, so what I'm going to do is this. I want to send a message, let's say Dinesh, I want to send that as the key as, as a message to Dinesh. So what I'll say is Dinesh, for we'll just use 77 as the modulus, right? And then what I do is I create a private number for myself, right? I create 13 as my private number. And then I do, I run that by that expression, right? So it is 19 to the power 13 modulus 77. That is the expression I run. Now Excel cannot handle those huge numbers, so I'm having to do it in in stages, right? For each stage, I'm I'm just doing it, and the final answer is 61, mm -hmm. right? And then I tell him, Dinesh, the answer is 61, right? Mm -hmm. What Dinesh does is he takes 61 as his input, he creates his own decrypting exponent as 37. He doesn't tell that number to anyone. He can mm -hmm. use it for multiple algorithms; it doesn't matter, right? And then he uses the same modulus of 77. So he is uh, doing the same operation. He has to do it 37 times because Excel issues, and he gets back the same number, right? Let me see if I can reduce this. I'm on screen now, right? So um, let me just show some examples here. If I'm sending 12, um, the cipher text is also 12. The final text is 12. If I send 3, 38 is what I exchange with Dinesh, and Dinesh gets 3 again. Right? At no point of time, Dinesh and I exchanged our private numbers. 13 and 37 were never exchanged. The only thing we exchanged was the modulus value. Right? 
So this is kind of how um, the base of an encryption algorithm, the asymmetric cryptography, asymmetric algorithm. So the data size of the HTTP is... Is exactly. That, now coming to the point. Yes, you are always stepping ahead. Uh, so OMG there are. Receiving no, rec so receiving is the same, right? It is using the same value here, right? It is using the same value of 77. So modulus of B2 is what it's using, right? Now there are guidelines in choosing this modulus and the encrypting exponent and the decrypting exponent. There are guidelines for them. And that's the reason why you have 2 to the power 2048. Yeah. So the guys creating these, these numbers for you are using extremely large numbers, right? 2 to the power 2048 is 2048 ones and zeros, yeah, the binary number. Like, and, exactly. And, 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 and yeah. let me show you here. I cannot have a number, I cannot send a number larger than 77 because like yeah. everything fails there, right? Yeah. Dinesh will get a number of one, which is not what I wanted to send, right? That's why they're actually going to higher and higher numbers at every, uh, after every so many years, I guess, right? So this is kind of the base of uh, what um, Diffie-Hellman, I think even other encrypting uh, and other asymm asymmetric algorithms might use. So this is kind of how asymmetric algorithm works. Now, if you if you put these in equations, so people who heard me say 77, they know, they, if they put the numbers in equation, they know m to the e modulus 77 equals 61, right? Because when I do 19, 61 is what I'll tell Dinesh, what I'll tell it out loud. Okay, for, can we use this algorithm on all the cryptography or thing, other thing like, for example, uh, um, document names, right? They are pretty big. No, no. We can reduce. For that, it. we we should use compression algorithm. Not. This will create uh, a bit length of your string. Okay. Will be a huge number, right? Compression. Compression and algorithm also work the similar. No, no, no. It, not, it not reduce in, it, right? Reducing so, compression that will be right? that will be a symmetric algorithm because your oh, receiving yeah, end should a, be that is a symmetric one. But this compression one is totally different. It is different right? one. This. Right. So if you put these in equations, you see you have m to the power e mod 77 equals 61. That's what people know. They know 77, they know 61. Mm -hmm. So they have one equation. And then the other equation they can also construct. It is 61 to the power d mod 77 equals m. Mm -hmm. Two equations, three variables. Good luck finding any of those numbers. Right. Especially you have powers mm -hmm. there, which are huge numbers. So it becomes really, really difficult. Right. So that I just wanted to give an example of, of an asymmetric algorithm. Any questions? No? All right, so I just have a few resources here. Um, I just want to talk about the last one. There is something called as a trace viewer, a service trace viewer for WCF. If you make your binding as HTTPS, you can actually see uh, in the stress viewer, you can actually see a request token and a response token kind of steps, kind of simulating your, your asymmetric algorithm, the key exchange algorithm and all those things. The rest of them are just details about uh, what is uh, SSL or TLS and DNS poisoning and how to read and understand what a cipher suite means and all those things. Okay, that's it. Cool. Thank you so much guys. Hope it was helpful.